All right, we're at the Crip Studio in Crouch End, and uh, as you can see, we're on the lovely Crouch Hill. Um, this is the building itself. It's still a working church. Um, so yeah, this is our little stairwell. Good place to put um, amps for reamping in a nice roomy stairwell. Yeah, I've done a lot of. Um, I've used this as a vocal chamber um, a couple of times where we've had a little speaker down here, and then just up here above the toilet, <laughs> put a um, stereo pair of mics. I think I used the Coles um, forty thirty eight pair um, and captured the ambience of the room. So I had a vocalist in the live room recording and then we were reamping live, um, like a sort of chamber sound out here. And it sounds amazing. And um, especially for drums and things, um, you, can, you can crank the speakers loud in the control room and uh, reamp the drums out of the door and capture the ambience of the room. So, um, and this is our control room. So um, we just revamped it at the start of last year, January last year, 2022, um, and put in this Dolby Atmos setup. Um, so yeah, big, big upgrade. Should we take you through? Yeah. So we've got a little booth here on the left, um, which we use for mainly bass amps, guitar amps, and then we'll put a vocalist in here if we've got a full band. But generally, most stuff gets done out here in the main room. Um, even vocals, you know, we'll set up a little booth out in the room. Drums, usually um, I'll either do, actually before the room got redone, I used to do it in this back corner here for a tighter sound because we had carpet and things on the wall. Um, but you know now if I want a tighter sound then I'll put these baffles behind on the, on the right hand side of the room. Um, and like I said, if you want an even tighter sound, we'll put both of these either side of the kit and then put a big thick blanket that we've got over the top and build a little tent, um, which is great for, for a tight sound. And then for a, a roomier sound, I tend to set them up just in the middle here. Um, and then you can put your room mics right back here and up high, and then you get that sort of big rock sound. So we've had like, um, done a lot of prog rock stuff actually in here with like four or five toms six symbols, all that kind of stuff. So that's, that position is great for that kind of thing. Um, and obviously that takes up a huge amount of space as well. So <laughs> it's better to bring it out into the room a bit more. My uh, taste tends to tend towards uh, sort of 70s kind of older kind of sounds. Um, but you know, obviously it depends on the project, but um, for overheads, we've got two great options, which I tend to grab for. Um, we've got these, two um, Sony C38Bs, which are great. They're a, um, a FET condenser, but they, they sound kind of dark like a ribbon. So I either go for those, or we've got a pair of these, which Joe told me, a pair of the coals. So if I don't want so much of the, the room from the top of the mic, because it's figure of eight, then I'll gravitate towards the, the Sonys. Um, so they're two great options for dark kind of stuff. And then for the sort of more modern kind of thing, we've got a pair of Kane 184s, which is a bit more classic. And so we can kind of cover a few different bases with, with those three setups, um, which is, you know, I tend to hop between those things. Um, and then more interesting microphones for drums are probably uh, this M260, uh, which is a ribbon microphone. Um, and that's great, actually, I use that actually mostly for hi-hats. <laughs> it's a really nice sort of, it's not too bright, it's nice and crunchy, actually. Um, so I tend to just shove it on the hi-hat. Um, but you can also use it as a sort of crush mic or something um, and stick that sort of over the kick drum pointing at the snare kind of thing and compress it on the way in. Or um, I've got a few different options for that kind of thing. Um, this. Bayer M380, 
is a really great microphone. It's got a big fat sound, um, a ribbon again, uh, but it can take quite a lot of level. So um, on drums, I would tend to use that um, as a mono kind of kit mic, do the kind of Mark Ronson rehab kind of sound, uh, you know, below, I and mean, I'll probably show you on the, on the drum kit, um, you know, put that down, down here um, to get a, a picture of the whole kit um, and then kind of cancel out the, the bottom of the tom a bit with the, with the null um, or that kind of thing as well, it usually sounds pretty good. Um, but this is also a great kick drum microphone as well because um, it can take a load of level. So you can stick that right in the middle of your drum. Um, I think that's uh, Steve Albini, that's his kind of sound, isn't it? Um, so you get loads of the, the low end of the drum, but you can also get the, the batter, the clickiness as well out of it. So it's quite a good all rounder. If you just want to use one kick drum mic, then this is the one I usually go for. You've got one of these old AKG D12s, which is kind of that Beatles thing. So if I'm doing an old kind of style drum recording, I'll reach for that on a kick drum. And then, you know, the more modern D112 flavor, which is also great for slightly clickier sound. And these um, PZM microphones as well, they're great just to shove in a kick drum or, you know, you can do a quick room mic by just chucking it on the floor as well. So, you know, um, I tend to keep things quite simple with drums, um, you know, less, the less microphones, the quicker everything is. Everything's so quick. Now, you know, we're doing a day session with someone on drums and we've got three, four songs to do. So you've not got an awful lot of time to be messing around with stuff. So I, I'll grab the stuff that I know is going to work, chuck in a few flavors of things. You know, maybe one day it will be a, a room mic on the floor or another day I'll do like a um, funny crunch mic on the on the drum kit. Yeah, I've been through different phases over the years um, of yeah different different setups. Went through a, a time actually of using through here. We've got one of these. Um, I think Joe used it the other day actually, didn't you? This the big trees. trees. Yeah. Got one of these, which is great. Um, you know, you can just plug an SM57 on a jack cable in the back, and then you've got a few controls for different distortion sounds um, and surreal tubes. Mm. in these yeah I had a band in a few weekends ago want a really sort of lo-fi really live roomy 90s sound um, and initially stuck uh, stuck a um, yeah like a crush mic into here for the drum kit but then also ended up using it on some vocals used it messed around a couple of the guitarists messed around with it as well it's like so versatile um, and can give a lot of that nice kind of like warm harmonics and kind of distortion on stuff when yeah. it's, yeah. So that's a really a fun thing to use or sticking things in our pig nose Oh yeah, exactly. as well. Yes, right, there we got, I think we, we did that live actually the, the other day, didn't we? With a, um, with a band. Yeah. So we had this, this little pig nose amp, uh, I think it was an SM57 on the drum kit plug straight into that, chucked in the corner there with a baffle Just next to it, and then put a mic on that for a sort of instant strange drum sound. So it worked yeah. out really well, actually. Um, and it's a great little guitar amp as well for reamping stuff. Or yeah, I think I mixed something with a snare sound with the pig nose and ended up using more of the pig nose track than the snare bottom, I think, in the end oh, really? for the kind of crunch of it. <laughs> nice. And it was pretty cool. Um, so, I mean, the, the centerpiece of this studio is our grand piano, which we've had for, you know, the, at least 10 years, I would say. Um, and it's a, it's a bit different from your standard kind of Steinway clean sounding thing. It's got loads of character, so it doesn't work for everything, but, um, you know, I go through a love-hate relationship with it. But um, it's, you know, this super warm kind of... It's got a great low end. Um, and yeah, so it, it works, I find it works really well on like overdubs. It just seems to slot into tracks really, really nicely. Um, and then, um, I, you know, if you go back to a, a VST kind of instrument, then it's just not, 
not the same. So we've got a few people that come in, especially for this piano, because um, they love it so much. Um, so that's the kind of darker kind of characterful sound. And then we've recently got this, um, this upright from a friend of the studios, which is like the complete opposite of the grand, which is super bright. So um, uh, it's great to have the two different flavors for, you know, depending on what the track is. And then if we do want a softer sound, you can put the felts on, which is a bit of a nicer um, soft sound which is you know all the rage at the moment with pop music and that kind of thing so um, yeah it's nice to have those two different flavors and then we've got a whole bunch of electric keyboards and things the Rhodes um, Wurlitzer which is great for that kind of crunchy kind of thing um, it's got loads of meat that speakers that are in the bottom um because normally yeah it's speakers are at the top on these things mm. um it's the loudest world it's uh, around isn't it oh that is model. it yeah yeah uh, okay yeah yeah i mean that's it so i think it was it was kind of modded in the late 70s to compete with like massive prog bands and they were, couldn't get enough volume just out of like the classic world it's uh, Right. So they built in that massive speaker, um, and yeah, it, it still can have the classic vibrato and kind of like more gentle thing, but yeah. it can really compete in a room. Yeah, it's got that kind of loud. The low end all seems to sort of merge together on these. It's just like super melded together that low end, and then you can. Get the high end. With the vibrato. Um, which is great. And then obviously this is a bit, a bit cleaner sounding the roads. And um, you can plug that through amps and things. Um, or this Watkins coffee cat, which is great sounding tape play. Um, so you can do all sorts of stuff with flicking the tape around while you play and get some crazy sounds, which is good fun. Um, and then we've got another Wurlitzer as well, which is a butterfly, um, which we're in the process of getting repaired at the moment. So I can't show you it, unfortunately, but it's basically the same innards as this Wurlitzer but in a wooden enclosure, so you basically get a woodier sound. <laughs> um, so it's a bit more honky than, than that Wurlitzer. Um, it's got a nice variation on the same kind of thing. Um, and then our Hammond as well, which is, you know, classic kind of Hammond sound with the, Whirly, uh, with the Leslie speaker. I can't remember that. I think it's an L100, this, this version. It's got a spring reverb on it as well. And then obviously all the draw bars and stuff. So um, that's a, yeah, it's a great bit of kit to have. Sounds way better than a, um, than a plug-in version. And it's, it's just great to have all these instruments for, um, you know, we record it on one day and it's different the next. And it's, you know, that classic thing of you, you've got a unique sound. So. Um, yeah, I feel like we've really got plenty of toys to get that, um, get lots of things accomplished in this space. Um, I and think it's what we, we enjoy, you know, having people in who do want to mess around as well and explore all the kit. And, you know, it's something that 
Nowadays, often doesn't feel so much of a, an option for bands when they've just got to get in, get the single recorded, get out. But being able to dwell and play with all of this stuff, you know, even say you start on the Whirly and then you move over to the Butterfly and you kind of have time to A, B and shoot out various, you know, preamps and mics and reamping. And yeah. it's great having all the gear in the room so you can just flip from one thing to another and think, oh, I'll add some harmonium. You know, I'll add a drone to this. I'll add some upright, yeah. brighten something up. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think we get lots of feedback from people as well. What they seem to really appreciate from this space is that, you know, like Joe said, all the kits in the room and we don't tend to faff around with stuff as well. You know, if someone wants to do a Wurlitzer, it's like, right, get the Wurlitzer out in the middle of the room stick a couple of mics on it and get recording. We're not spending hours and hours, you know, unless it warrants that and we've got the time to do it, obviously, you know, I'm happy to make stuff sound as good as we can get it, but we try and not get in the way of the musicians just getting into something because if they've got to wait around half an hour until you get the whirlets around then the inspiration's kind of lost. So um, we really try and, you know, keep on top of, uh, the process and um, make stuff just sort of happen and be uh, as smooth as possible, seamless as possible. So um, mm. that's kind of what is unique about the space. Um, in that sense, we've got loads of toys and um, people can just pick up and grab stuff and we'll get it recorded in for them. We've got a great selection of drums. So this is our 60s Ludwig kit, um, which has an amazing sound. And then we've got a Gretsch um, kit as well, which they all live up in this um, loft space, um, which goes right um, the length of the, the, uh, the width of the room here. Um, so we've got a Gretsch kit up there and a Yamaha stage custom. Um, so yeah, a few different flavors of drums. And then um, we must have about five or six snare drums up there so as well. Uh, Ricky's a uh, bassist. Um, and this is his, uh, Ricky's Rickenbacker. Um, so yeah, we've got a few different basses here. Um, it's weird because like, he's a bassist, but he seems like more obsessed with collecting old keyboards than anything yes. else. Which is yeah. like, he doesn't play any of them. He just sort of chucks <laughs> them all in here, which yeah. is great. But yeah, uh, um, but yeah, that's, you know, that's why we've got a big, huge couple of bass amps and, uh, yeah, so we've got his Rickenbacker, this sort of um, Hofner style Paul McCartney bass. So yeah, we can kind of cover most bases with like um, JCM 800. Not that we do a huge amount of heavy kind of music here, but um, you know, we can get that kind of sound out of this. Um, this just goes super, super loud. Um, and the low end on, on the speakers, it just sounds amazing. Um, and then, you know, all the way to like the clean kind of stuff, like the Fender Twin. Um, this little champ has got, for the size of it, it sounds amazing. <laughs> um, and it's so simple, you've got volume, treble and bass, um, and there's not much else to it. So um, if you want to crunch it up, you've got to turn the volume up basically. <laughs> so um, yeah, those two are great. And then um, if you don't, the, the Twin's got that Fender kind of sound, but if you don't want to get that kind of um, that kind of thing, then this Music Man sort of covers the other end of the of the spectrum. It's like a nice clean amp that doesn't sound like a Fender. Um, and then the smaller version of it has got this great sounding phaser on it as well. So you can get some cool sounds off that. Yeah, this angle is uh, super, super heavy, but it's got an amazing um, sort of, yeah, prog, um, grungy, you know, like the, the super distorted kind of sound. And uh, really thick. Yeah, yeah it's, it's great. Between that and the, the Marshall, we can get the heavier tones pretty much covered. Don't tend to do an awful lot of, uh, you know, as much as we, like doing it don't tend to get an awful lot of guitar recording through the door where you've got the time to really mess around with amps and stuff all that a lot of it seems to be done on computers 
these days. Um, it's all a bit sad. Yes. <laughs> Fan of that. <laughs> yeah. um, and then bass we wise. More guitars. We need more guitars. <laughs> yeah. Bass wise, um, between the Ampeg and this Fender Bassman, you've got the sort of the old and the new kind of tones. Um, I'm not very good at speaker sizes, but I think this is a 4x12. No, 4x10? What would that be? That would be 12, I think. 4x something. And a 1x something. Let's call it 4x12. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, we've got um, two good options for um, for bass. And then, you know, usually... What mics do you normally stick on the uh, bass amp? I normally go for the um, Neumann T... Um, was it TLM 170? Um, I use that mic for a lot of low end kind of stuff, uh, so like bass amps or cellos and things, um, tends to sound really nice on. Um, and I'm kind of at the moment favouring the um, the kind of Beatles, like you pull the mic further back from the bass amp, um, just to get a bit more air in between um, the amp and the microphone. Um, but then a lot of the time in the mix, the DI is the, the one that you, you reach for in the end. Um, so, but it's, you know, it's great having the sort of, the saturation of the, of the real amp that you can blend in. If and especially if you patch it through the, the pre's as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what well, on the, on the DI? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 So that UA is great for DI bass as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we've got some nice compression options on the way in for, for bass as well. So, um. We're pretty well covered for bass tones in the in the studio. You know, I think most studios tend to have those um, flip top B15s, don't they? Just a little thing in the corner. Where we've got a nice big stack of things. So, uh, so yeah, the control room, uh, like I said, was redone at the start of last year, um, and it was actually a, a great process to go through because. Um, I think I'd been here maybe two, three years prior to that, and we'd been using these um, DigiDesign 192s were our converters, and um, having worked in the space for a while, I kind of seen what the problems were with the previous setup. So when I put this rig together and wired it all, we just tried to make it as flexible as possible. So um, it's all based around this uh, Pro Tools Matrix Studio system, which integrates with our um, our Dolby Atmos 1.4 rig um, and that's where our monitoring comes from and then our conversion is all done on these Dante um, Focusrite um, converters so the whole place is networked and we can send audio from one part of the building to the other so if I want to plug in a laptop I just set it up plug in an Ethernet cable and make it come out the speakers um, so there's all sorts of little bits like that where we can send one thing to the other. Um, there's Ethernet sockets out in the in the live room as well. So if we've got um, a band with a bunch of DIs, you can stick a Dante box out there and just get it straight back in here. So it's all really flexible in that sense. Um, and yeah, so that's our main our main recording rig. Um, and then outboard wise, we've got a few different. Uh, flavors of things, um, you know, the classic Uri 1176 LN, um, and then we've got this uh, UA uh, 6176, which is, uh, I love that for um, for bass, mainly the preamp side of it, um, you know, it's great for uh, with this low band EQ, um, you can stick that all the way down to 70 and then Add, it, add even more bass to it so um, or you know crank it all the way up um, so that's yeah that works really great for that kind of stuff or uh, cello I've used it for as well um, yeah I think it's our only tube pre so um, yeah that gets used a lot for that kind of flavor of things um, this one the Apogee is a bit of a hidden gem it's a um, it's a preamp but it's also a converter I'm not using it for the the conversion it's just analog in and out um, but if you want that super clean kind of pop vocal it just sounds you know pristine so 
I've, I've done sessions where we've been on the focus right preamps or something and it's just not coming together and you stick it into that and it just all comes to life you hear all the detail yeah monitoring wise we are on uh, Adams we've got three Adam S3H's along the front um, which are amazing sounding uh, the whole room is calibrated um, by Dolby so we've got basically got EQ curves on all the speakers here I'm doing way less tweaks to things than I was in the past so it's a really really great room to mix in and then obviously with the Atmos set up as well um, we've got uh, these are Adam A77X's mm -hmm. um, so th they take up the surround ones we had these um, these mounts custom made by studio people for us um, to get these up in the ceiling and uh, yeah it's just a great great room to mix in on Atmos um, the big old sub as well oh yeah and the, <laughs> yeah, the subwoofer is actually in that um, that box and it is the size of that box as well it's like a washing machine so um, yeah if we if we really want um, to crank up the low end we've got this client setting which basically has a a 4 dB, I think it is, 3 or 4 dB boost on the low end. So if we want to impress people, <laughs> then we can just crank that up. Um, and yeah, it sounds, sounds great in here. Generally, I mean, we do so many different things here, but generally we do um, indie bands and uh, label artists as well. It tends to be um, just the current state of music is overdub sessions. So it'll be like a day of drums or um, a day of piano or something and maybe a bit of vocals at the end. Um, and then I would say actually we, the majority of stuff we get is like um, ensemble recording. So like um, string quartets or uh, I did a, a great um, gospel choir album recently as well, which is great. I think we had 13 or so singers for that. Um, and uh, yeah, great sounding room for drums um, and a lot of um, music shoots as well so um, because we kind of straddle the world of uh, location recording as well um, we are really set up and and know the ins and outs of recording to picture as well so we can do the time code and all that kind of stuff um, as well and we've got the lighting rig on the ceiling so um, and we're well kitted out for for video shoots um, and uh, yeah, we can mix the picture as well. So um, yeah, we do that kind of stuff. Yeah, I'm trying to think what else we what else we do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean we're trying. We're making an effort to get more kind of Indian unsigned artists through the door as well. We've started like a free membership program, so that those who are less economically secure as a band maybe they don't have like a record deal or or maybe the indie label doesn't have the budget to give a massive advance for lots of studio time we've we're working on a lot of reduced rates and more like community and creative um kind of schemes and projects to get people through the door feeling like they've got time to dwell on stuff and really try everything and be really creative and and we're getting a lot more bands through the door now that want to do you know all of them in a room six or seven people loads of live takes trying all kinds of fun little tricks and techniques um, and that's great and that's really good fun as well because often it's one of the bigger studios they've managed to spend a lot of time in before so very excitable want to try everything it's less of that major label right we need these overdubs in and out within this time frame or whatever um and yeah i think it's it's something we're spending more and more time engaging with and wanting to foster that sense of community and creativity here um so yeah go check out our membership um if that's something that appeals for sure yeah uh, yeah we're definitely making an effort to try and uh, bring people back to the recording studio because it feels like you know people are getting priced out of yeah of i mean the infrastructure in. for arts especially somewhere like london is just so shocking you know between rent renting hikes and lack of funding and 
gen you know gentrification generally upping rent and making music venues and spaces that were once kind of refuges for creativity um everything's getting kind of strong armed out of these spaces so trying to resist that and be take the responsibility as a studio to really refocus and engage with these people who haven't been able to access or at least sustainably access these kind of spaces um, has been something that we're really um, we hold very highly in terms of what's important within a studio space and a creative space generally um, and it's more fun for yeah. us as well yeah because that yeah. means we get more wildly interesting and daring and inspirational things through the door that might not have the budget of a major label or whatever but you know they want to use they want to plug everything through a big trees or they want to yeah. mess around in the stairwell or they want to do whatever yeah. um which yeah. for us is yeah it's engaging for them and it's engaging for us so yeah um yeah the more kind of interesting techniques that we can use and try out and try and make something really creative than just a you know typical drum setup and you know we're all for it and yeah. basically yeah once it's in the track